General George Washington. Long before he became the father of America, he was leading a ragtag army in a desperate attempt to turn the tide of the American Revolution. One image stands out above all others in that period of American history. The immortal vision of the proud general and his determined army crossing the Delaware River on a snowy Christmas night in 1776. Washington crossing the Delaware is one of the most recognized images in the world. But the real George Washington proves to be much more enigmatic. I'm Bill Boggs. Come along as we visit the site of the dramatic crossing and other important places where Washington the general helped shape American history. All places worth exploring for every historic traveler. Today's journey takes us from the small hamlet of Newtown, Pennsylvania to the scenic river setting of Washington Crossing. From there, we make our own crossing of the Delaware into Trenton, New Jersey, where Washington ambushed the British before heading back west to the rolling hills of Valley Forge, just 20 miles from Philadelphia. the quaint little town of Newtown, Pennsylvania. Washington slept back there, he slept over there, and he probably slept up here. The general never stayed in one place too long, so many of the historic buildings are connected to him in some way. There are a few historic inns that have the perfect ambiance to get you in the mood for some historic traveling. Places like Ye Old Temperance House, gracing South State Street, since 1772. The tavern here is lively and connects the colonial style bedrooms to the original dining area. George Washington's officers would come here to seek comfort during the darkest days of the revolution. Be sure to take some time to wander through Newtown. You'll come across a cemetery that contains the graves of 22 Revolutionary War soldiers. The Presbyterian church on the edge of the cemetery was used to house Hessian prisoners after the Battle of Trenton, a battle that was triggered by the dramatic events just five miles from here at what's now called Washington Crossing. In the winter of 1776, the war for independence was going badly for the Continental Army. General George Washington and his tattered men had been outmaneuvered at the Battle of Long Island they were chased across New Jersey and into Pennsylvania by the British. American morale was at an all-time low. What Washington desperately needed was a victory. That victory began here, along the frozen banks of the Delaware River on Christmas Day, 1776. From the top of Bowman's Hill Tower in Washington Crossing Historic Park, you get a magnificent view of the surrounding countryside. And it's easy to imagine the hardships that Washington and his men faced as they prepared for battle. It's even easier to visualize the army here if you're able to catch one of the reenactments of the Continental Encampment, which happens several times a year. You can contact the park office for their schedule. Bob Gerencher is one of the park's many costumed interpreters. He will show us what life was like for Washington and his ragged army that winter. Bob, what was the mindset of the men as they set up camp on this side of the river? The troops were cold, fatigued, and hungry. Many of them didn't have tents and were forced to sleep on the frozen ground. The continental currency was worthless, and tavern keepers wouldn't take the soldiers inside. The troops were forced to eat raw flour from the mill. What about fresh supplies and other troops? No supplies were forthcoming, and the Continental Army was going to be disbanded on January 1. Enlistments were expired. Washington knew he had to do something, so he called a meeting of his top officers here at the Thompson Neely House. Present arms. It was in these tiny rooms that the course of American history was decided. 
Washington knew that a spark was needed to rekindle the flames of patriotism. Deciding to take the offensive, he huddled with his officers to devise a surprise attack. The principal target was to be the Hessian soldiers based across the river to the south at Trenton, New Jersey. The army would cross the Delaware River at three separate points under cover of darkness on Christmas night. The main force would march nine miles to attack the Hessian mercenaries before sunrise. The main crossing site of Washington's army is preserved in the part of the park known as McConkie's Ferry Section. It's about three and a half miles south of the Thompson's Mill area. You'll find the visitor center here, together with several 19th century reconstructed homes and McConkie's Ferry Inn, where legend has it that Washington had dinner on the night of the crossing. As his officers discussed last minute details, Washington must have wondered if he was making a fatal mistake. But when it came time to move his 2,400 troops across the swollen river, he was ready. Bob, tell me about this beautiful boat. This is a replica of the famous Durham boats that Washington used to cross the Delaware here. It was kind of his secret weapon. With these boats, he was able to transfer troops and equipment quickly across the river. Well, what makes him so special with the design? It was made specifically to haul heavy loads downriver, iron ore from the Durham mines north on the Delaware. As such, they could carry 30 to 40 uh, people with no problem or several pieces of artillery without going aground. Well, this boat looks much larger than the one in the famous painting. It is. Dorm boats were about this size, and in fact, there were others that were 20 and 30 feet even longer. I think Emmanuel Leutze uh, got caught up in the spirit of the moment and tried to present some of the drama. A reenactment of the famous crossing is held every Christmas afternoon, usually in the same winter weather that was Washington's biggest problem on that night. He and his men fought their way across through sleet and a blinding snowstorm. But these conditions ultimately prevented Washington's supporting divisions, two of their three prongs, from making the crossing. But the general persevered and against all odds completed the crossing. Though many hours behind schedule, they were on their way to Trenton. We continue our journey across the Delaware into New Jersey and south along the river to the city of Trenton. This is virtually the same route taken by Washington and his men after they crossed the Delaware River. They'd been slowed by the terrible winter storm and were about to lose the cover of darkness. As they reached the outskirts of Trenton, the sun began to rise. Washington was not about to call off the attack. He split his forces and approached Trenton from two sides. One group, led by General Nathaniel Green, advanced up the hills along the Pennington Road. The second group, led by General John Sullivan, advanced along the riverbank. But where did they find the Hessian soldiers? Many historians used to believe that it was here, at the Hessian barracks in the heart of current downtown Trenton. These buildings were reconstructed in 1914 partly under the belief that this is where the famous Battle of Trenton took place. However, modern historians have discovered otherwise. Washington did not find the German soldiers drunk at the barracks, as many of us had been taught in history class. But that doesn't make the barracks any less interesting to visit. Douglas Winterick is the associate director of the Barracks Museum. He gives us a more accurate account of the barracks history. Doug, why are these barracks an important historical site to visit? Well, this barracks is one of five built in New Jersey during the French and New War. The officers' house is where we're standing now, housed the officers. And in the barracks section, that's where the soldiers stayed, is recreated to look as it was during the Revolutionary War as a hospital. And that is what, why you see the display of tools and the like. But during Washington's attack on Trenton, he did not consider this a military target? No, actually only a few Hessian Jaeger riflemen were here, probably as scouts, and perhaps to protect the civilians that were also housed in this building. But most of the Hessians were actually throughout the town, housed through all the way around the town. And this is only just a sort of a way station. The Battle of Trenton actually took place in the streets of the city. Washington began the attack at about 8 a.m. Green had his troops and artillery stationed at the top of a hill with a commanding view of the city. The Trenton Battle Monument was built on the hilltop in 1891 to commemorate the fight. 
A trip to the top of the monument, which is open Wednesday through Sunday, affords some dramatic views. Well, Doug, from up here, we certainly get a commanding view of Trenton. Yes, actually, it works out very well because this spot marks the spot where Washington put his cannons and fired down the streets at the Hessian forces, who filed out of the houses and attempted to attack Washington's position here. And every time they would try to regroup and attack, Washington would fire down. At one point, they tried to go to another street, but Washington just turned his guns and fired down on them at that way. First time, really well-trained Hessian troops broke and ran in a panic. Doug, were the Hessians surprised because they had been out celebrating Christmas? Well, that is actually an entire folklore. Rawl was reported to have been drinking, but his soldiers himself were not. They were quite surprised because of the weather. Rawl had not sent out the patrol that morning because of the severe blizzard. And then also, there was an interesting piece of luck that occurred to Washington. He had ordered no troops to move 24 hours before the attack. One small contingent did not hear that. They attacked Trenton, and even though Rawl had been warned of a small attack, he thought that that small attack that had occurred earlier was the attack and laughed it off. Little did he realize that later on, the entire Continental Army was going to be coming into town. The battle only lasted about 90 minutes. 298 Hessians were taken prisoner and brought back across the river to be held in Newtown. The Continental Army had won its biggest victory yet in their war for independence. But the story in Trenton did not end there. British General Cornwallis brought his army here within a matter of days. Washington's men met them at the Asunpik Creek, where a stone bridge once spanned the rapids. The ensuing clash is known as the Second Battle of Trenton. Washington held off three attacks by the British. He finally withdrew his army toward Princeton during the night of January 2nd, 1777, to avoid being outflanked and trapped by Cornwallis. Washington won the major victory he was seeking here in Trenton, and as he anticipated, it rekindled the spirit of patriotism the colonists needed to win their fight for independence. While you're visiting Trenton, be sure to stop by the Trent House, built in 1719 by the city's founder and namesake. Prior to the battle, the rooftop cupola was used by Hessian soldiers to keep a watchful eye on the Continental Army across the river. But cannon shot kept them from peeking out more than once or twice a day. You may also enjoy visiting the historic State House, the second oldest Capitol building in America, the New Jersey State Museum next door, or the Douglas House, where Washington prepared for his surprise maneuver against the British in Princeton. We wrap up our story of Washington the General by heading back into Pennsylvania and going west to Valley Forge. As the winter of 1777-78 approached, Washington had a crucial decision to make. The British had landed in upper Chesapeake Bay and completely overtaken Philadelphia. If the General left and set up a safe winter camp in western Pennsylvania, the British would remain unchecked. If he stayed, his troops could starve. Washington refused to leave and instead burrowed in for a long, harsh, and deadly winter. Today, historians are still arguing whether Washington made a costly mistake by setting up winter camp here at Valley Forge, just 20 miles from the enemy. If you're planning your own overnight encampment, you might try the Great Valley House with its own fair share of history. This bed and breakfast was built in 1720. It offers three exquisite rooms in colonial decor and a beautiful country setting just 10 minutes from the historical park. The park roadways follow the outer line defenses around the encampment, up Mount Joy, and along the inner line defenses. You should start your visit at the Park Visitor Center for maps and to view their collection of firearms, swords, and other items used at the camp. On loan from the Historical Society Museum is General Washington's marquee tent used throughout the war. A great place to get a feel for the fortifications at Valley Forge is at Readout 3, located at the top of Mount Joy. Bill Tropman, one of the park's costumed historical interpreters, describes the defenses. Bill, why did Washington choose this location, Valley Forge, for the winter encampment? 
It's a naturally defensible position. A high ground, Mount Joy and Mount Misery behind us, the Schuylkill River on one flank, and to the south, another ridge line. The one weak spot in the defenses was this low ground in here where a road enters the encampment from the south. So what did Washington do about that? Well, to remedy that situation, they built a readout right in here, an enclosed earthen fortification. And he had artillery that could fire down here and rake this position to keep the enemy from coming in this way. At several locations along the park roads, reconstructed huts marked brigade sites where thousands of men wintered. Well, believe it or not, there were 12 men in each one of these huts. And uh, they're built uh, according to Was General Washington's specifications, 14 by 16 feet. A lot of the men came in here didn't have uh, winter clothing, let alone blankets. And before long, illness was epidemic. Was it the lack of clothing and the cold that really caused the disease? Um, it wasn't as cold as many people think. A fairly mild winter, you might say. Um, there's no record of frostbite for among the soldiers in all the months that they were here. But it's this lack of sanitation, mud everywhere, a lot of dead horses. They're not bathing properly. Blankets and uh, clothing were taken from the uh, dead soldiers and from the sick and reused. So you can imagine how quickly the disease would spread. General Washington spent a large part of his time in his headquarters writing letters to Congress asking for clothing and food for his ill-equipped and starving men. Many couldn't take the harsh conditions and several thousand troops deserted. While Congress and officers were aware of the Army's plight, the American public was deliberately misinformed. This kept the British ignorant of the true weakness of the camp, but it made it difficult to raise aid for the men. The area just behind the Conway huts is called the Von Steuben Parade Grounds, named for the man who helped shape the Americans into an efficient fighting machine. Bill, was in February uh, that a German officer arrives here at Valley Forge, Friedrich von Steuben. He is a captain in the army of Frederick the Great in an earlier war. A colorful character, didn't speak much English. And when he worked with the troops in frustration, he would uh, well, he'd use some profanity in a number of different languages. Well, what exactly did he teach the soldiers? Bill, an improved uh, method of drill and training and maneuvering. Before, they were marching Indian file, and he has them in column. And now, even at brigade and division level, they've improved that. But especially that drill, a simplified manual of arms. And they were drilling every day. Charge with cartridge. Valley Forge is often remembered as a test of endurance for the American soldiers, but it's perhaps more important that they left Valley Forge well-trained and an efficient fighting force. It's inspiring to look out on the Grand Parade Ground and imagine hundreds or thousands of poorly clad soldiers drilling for hours each day, motivated by their fight for freedom. Fire! The Continental Army lost 2,000 men to disease. The memorial arch commemorates the lives of those who died and the resolve of those 6,000 soldiers who marched out of here ready to chase the British once again across New Jersey. Another commemorative building here in Valley Forge is the Washington Memorial Chapel. It's an active Episcopal church filled with beautiful stained glass revolutionary images and decorative engravings. The Museum of the Valley Forge Historical Society is next door. Washington's silver camp cups are among the many artifacts on display. It is said that after a few hearty toasts celebrating the French joining the revolution, the normally reserved Washington mounted his horse, waved his hat in the air, and shouted, Huzzah! Long live the King of France! The date was May 6th and the long encampment at Valley Forge was nearly over. The troops gathered in the Grand Parade Ground and in an historical version of the wave, fired their muskets in quick succession, saluting the new alliance. Victory was indeed a real possibility. Our trip along the path of Washington the General should take you about three to four days. Of course, you'll need more time if you also want to take in the many historic sites in nearby Philadelphia, like Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. Or heading further west, you can visit Brandywine Battlefield Park, 
where Washington clashed with British forces just before his encampment at Valley Forge. Mention the name George Washington and most people picture the elderly face on a one dollar bill, the father of our country. But the man who led America to freedom during the revolution was a much younger, daring man. And taking a trip like this gives you a new insight into the challenges that tested great men like Washington, the general. I'm Bill Boggs. Thanks for joining me on Historic Traveler.